And it's also being live streamed on YouTube currently. And I'm going to start the webinar right now. And it's also being live streamed on YouTube currently. All right, I start seeing um, participation numbers going up. All right, so um, I will just start. This is the about time. So um, my name is Denai Kemasuwan. I'm one of the uh, finance committee with the WABIP. I would like to, uh, on the behalf of the WEIP, I would like to welcome everyone to the uh, the webinar by the WEIP. Um, I would like to thank you, Marit, for sponsor this webinar. And uh, today we have a, an excellent speaker in this topic, Dr. George Chang. He's a boss certified um, IP and also the IP medical director and the uh, University of California in San Diego. So uh, he graduated from the uh, very prestigious the IP training program in the US at the Bed Israel Deconnaissance in Boston, which is a hardware system. So um, prior to joining the uh, UCSD Health, Dr. Sheng is a, was a faculty at Duke University. And uh, um, in addition to his clinical work, he also uh, performed uh, significant research in technology and clinical innovation. He received the uh, Young Investigator Award from the Harvard Medical School on uh, his work on developing the 3D printing guided personalized airway processes. So uh, I think he's the best uh, person who can give this talk. So I will hand the baton to uh, Dr. Josh Chang. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kawasami. Um, so, so, uh, so, uh, hi everyone. Um, and before I start, I'd like to uh, uh, take a moment to thank the WABIP uh, for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, and again, thank Merit for sponsoring this uh, uh, webinar. Um, and, and really, it's just uh, such a pleasure to be here and sharing uh, this journey uh, uh, with everyone. So, uh, as uh, uh, Denai has mentioned um, uh, uh, earlier. Uh, the my interest in uh, airway stenting really started since I was a fellow uh, over a decade ago, uh, and I hope to, uh, at the end, toward the end of the talk, we can uh, take a little moment uh, to go through that journey. And for those who are fellows who are on the call, um, I hope you may um, provide some type of uh, uh, of inspiration or guidance uh, from the experience uh, from my own experience um, as an interventional poem fellow. Um, and just toying with an idea and ultimately seeing how it's being implemented now in clinical setting. Um, so again, my name is George Chang. I serve as the Director of Interventional Pulmonology, Bronchoscopy and Pleural Disease. I'm also the Associate Program Director of Interventional Pulmonology Fellowship here at UCSD. Um, and as part of the disclosures, I do consult for a variety of companies. Um, regarding technology and innovation, uh, device design, um, and also we perform research with the various companies' uh, um, uh, funds, uh, fundings as listed here. Uh, again, uh, this uh, webinar is sponsored by Merit Medical. Um, here are the disclosures from Merit Medical. 
And before I start any um, uh, talk, uh, I learned very early on to have the thank you slide as the first few slides, because often talks run late uh, and toward the end, people drop out um, and um, you don't get a chance to actually tell everyone um, uh, thank you for the people who actually make your job and make our job uh, uh, capable or able to do our jobs. So these are um, these are um, images uh, from the past year, uh, and these are images from my group at UCSD. Uh, on this side, you see the founder of the UCSD International Pulmonology Program, Dr. Jim Harrell, uh, who is now retired. Uh, and he's here uh, giving, uh, participating in education of our clinical staff. Uh, and these are uh, the group of people who make my job um, um, happen. Uh, they're my respiratory therapist and my uh, nurses uh, and our schedulers. Uh, we have about 30 uh, uh, different, uh, uh, perform uh, different um, uh, support staff from various capacities. And here is where you see our partners uh, in my group um, and our and with our fellow, uh, our interventional poem fellow. They uh, make my world run. Uh, they're phenomenal people and a lot of fun to uh, uh, to be around with. And here is one of the uh, very first beer session that we had uh, where we talked about research and what to do next uh, for this coming year. Um, so again, um, a little quick bit about UCSD Interventional Poem Program, and I invite people who are on the call who's interested to visit, please reach out to us. We would love to meet you in person. We'd love to host you guys here at, the U, uh, at UCSD for a visit and show you around San Diego. Um, so uh, over the past 40 years, um, the IP program uh, have really flourished here in, uh, at UCSD. Um, and you'll see that it's actually a variety of people. It's not just me, it's a, a, a lot of people whose contribution. Um, Dr. Jim Harrell, as I mentioned, Dr. Henry Cote was here. Uh, Dr. Samir McConney and David Riker were here before I, was, before I joined. Um, and uh, after transition, uh, multiple physicians between 2017 and 2019, I joined and led the program since 2019. Since then, uh, we're the largest and most comprehensive IP program in San Diego. Um, and um, uh, currently we have five physicians, one nurse practitioner, um, and uh, uh, my partner, Dr. Carrie Ann Malnostra, who recently joined us. She leads our IP fellowship program and is shepherding the program to going through the ACGME uh, application process. Dr. Russ Miller has been a constant force uh, of uh, stability for us. Uh, he uh, he leads the IP program in Baboa, the Naval Hospital, and he comes over uh, uh, and, and joining our group uh, for uh, difficult cases. Um, and uh, Dr. Noral, Noral Patel, who leads our uh, BLVR program or lung bon uh, bronchoscopic lung bone reduction program. Um, doc and also Dr. Jorge Monios, uh, who leads our trach PEG program. Uh, he is a reason that uh, uh, joined us uh, this uh, past October. Um, and uh, also uh, uh, Kelly Ball, who's our uh, nurse practitioner who leads our uh, uh, pleural clinic. Uh, and all of this, uh, this entire operation wouldn't, uh, wouldn't happen without the Gina Maltz, our uh, unit manager, uh, who make the, the, the world goes round uh, in every single day. Uh, a quick comment about uh, IP fellowship training program uh, at UCSD um, uh, and also in the uh, in, uh, United States. Uh, Interventional poem is now the second most competitive uh, medicine specialty. Uh, gastroenterology being the most competitive, uh, and we're tied with cardiology. 61% um, increasing applicants since 2019, with 21% increasing positions since 2019 in this specialty. Um, and it is the most competitive medicine subspecialty by match statistics. Um, in, 20, uh, uh, in this past season, in 2023, we'll have 50 applicants for one spot with a match day in November 29th of this past year. As you can see that the numbership, uh, the number of fellowship program is, has been increasing tremendously in this, uh, um, in this ex accelerated slope. Uh, the number uh, of the corresponding fellowship positions also is increasing and the number of applicants is actually taking a, a dramatic increase. Um, again, we're the only IP training program in San Diego region. Uh, the IP fellowship uh, in 2023 matched our uh, first IP fellow via, via the national uh, matching program 
And uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Caleb Taylor, uh, who is the United States only IP trainee who, um, uh, who went through emergency medicine, internal medicine, pulmonary critical care training, plus an MPH in medical leadership. Um, so he is truly unique. Um, and our uh, um, incoming IP fellow, Dr. Bryce Dukeman, um, who is a gem to have. He's uh, actually a current faculty at UCSD who decided to come back uh, to train in interventional poem. So now with that, um, I'm going to move into the actual core of the talk, um, which is uh, a historical review of airway stents. We will review the indications. We will actually cover uh, the variety of different stents that are currently available on market in the United States and touch on some of the stents that are available outside of the United States. And then we're gonna visit future directions. So a brief history of stent. Where does the word stent come from? Well, it actually comes from uh, the 1800s when a dentist named Charles Stent first coined the term of stent because he was actually using a material to make um, impression for edentulous patients. So with that, um, we move forward to the late 1800s where there's surgical implantation of stent by Dr. Trendelenburg and Dr. Bond, where you see that these stents are made from plastic tubings or metal. And then it's not until the next century in 1965, uh, when Montgomery T-tube uh, 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 that's made of silicone was introduced. Um, and then the next, uh, the next um, uh, uh, iteration of airway stents came in 1980 uh, when Dr. Franz Jean-Swan Dumont uh, introduced silicone stents, which is this totally internalized silicone ciliastic uh, uh, stent uh, in the airway. And then we're moving to 1990s when variety of different stents that's either made of pure steel um, uh, without covering, uh, being repurposed into the airway, and then the second generation soon uh, arrived, which is our, uh, these stents made from a variety of different materials, uh, uh, namely nitinol. And then finally, the third generation stent where it's fully covered um, and, um, and, and with a variety of uh, delivery systems, which we'll review uh, later on in the talk. So what are the indications of stent placements? Uh, well, really, it is to establish dependency of compressed or stenotic central airways, whether due to um, benign or malignant uh, etiologies. It supports weakened cartilages. Um, so, for instance, in this case, uh, like a disease entity like trichobronchomalacia. Also, it kind of serve to seal any fistulas or dehiscence to the esophagus or pleural cavity or mediastinal cavity. So these are the three large categories. Um, now, what are the indications for stenting for malignant uh, central airway obstruction? Well, it uh, often depends on how the, uh, how the disease is presenting itself. So um, the tumor could be compressing against the airway externally for totally externally compressed airway. You could have a mixed stenosis if the luminal resection is insufficient to open the airway. The diameter airway could be less than 50% uh, of normal um, disease after endoscopic therapy. And in those instances, you may want to consider to putting, this, uh, putting the uh, stent to achieve full patency. Um, Malaysia, due to uh, tumor destruction of the cartilaginous support, is another reason. And also, we sometimes quite often see rapid tumor growth. And in those situations, when we can bridge the patient from the initial treatment to uh, the uh, more definitive treatment, either radiation or systemic treatments response, we also will put a temporizing stent in. And finally, tra uh, trichoesophageal fistula that is malignant in etiology. Granted, it has to be localizing an area that is amenable to stent placement. So in here, uh, in this uh, diagram, you see the three different forms of uh, a tumor growth. One of them is completely endogenous, the other one is exogenous, and the other one is mixed. In these two instances, uh, airway stenting would be uh, indicated. In the first in case, really the debulking and, uh, and in an attempt to kind of completely achieve tumor-free tumor -free zone is advocated. So 
Now, uh, what are the indication of stenting benign airway stenosis? Most of the talk at the title of the talk suggests what we focus on malignant etiology. This will be the only slide that we're going to talk about benign etiology. Well, we often visit for complex tracheal stenosis to serve uh, to serve as a bridge to surgery or for patients who are not surgical candidates. For simplicity's sake, we divide the tracheal stenosis between simple versus complex. Complex is any uh, tracheal stenosis that's involved cartilaginous rings or have a malacic component to it, or is greater than one centimeter in, uh, in length. Um, whereas the tracheal, uh, the second, um, uh, whereas, uh, where the simple ones are exactly the ones opposite, whereas less than one centimeter, simple web shape does not involve cartilage or no, uh, nor does it have a malaise component. Uh, tracheal bronchus, uh, tracheal or bronchus stenosis from inflammatory or infectious process while waiting for response to systemic treatment is also a consideration. What are some of the inflammatory processes? Uh, well, uh, one of the uh, inflammatory process would be considered would be a GPA. An in infectious process in, the, in some of the developing world would be considered would be tuberculosis. Uh, lung transplant or other anesthetic uh, um, stenosis uh, is also an indication. Uh, tracheal bronchomalacia with a short-term stent trial is because consideration. And again, also a benign tracheal esophageal fistula could also be considered. So when we look at the contemporary uh, uh, evaluation of metallic stents, we already talked about the three different generations of the metallic stent. As mentioned, the material has changed. The indication of how it's being done has changed. So the first generation of metallic, skin, uh, metallic stent is often made from stainless steel. They are not really made for the airway. They're made for the vasculature. Where the second generation stent, the material has changed to nitinol and it's partially covered or uncovered. And then the third generation, generation stent is um, uh, made of nitinol or steel with Foley coverage, either woven or laser cut. A variety of um, factors are important to consider when placing a stent. Stent sizing is perhaps the most important aspect. If you oversize the stent, you may risk the development of granulation tissue or the development of ischemia along the side of the stent where the area of the stent was placed. So by the time you remove the stent, that ischemia will potentially convert a stenotic lesion into a malasic lesion. Now the undersiding of the stent can be the, causing the opposite problem. Instead of having granulation tissue being a potential issue, you will have migration as a potential problem to have to deal with. Stent location is also critical to consider. Subglottic trachea is a notoriously difficult area to stent because the location um, involving phonation and the proximity to the, um, to the upper trachea where the shape of the trachea shifts from a semicircle to a more egg ovoid, uh, ovoid um, um, uh, shape. Um, stent factors such as exposed metallic uh, or is exposed metallic distal ends of the stent can cause granulation formation to those area. While it provides anchoring for the stent, it may make the extraction of the stents more difficult. The degree of stent covering is important because sometimes if the covering is too, um, too thin, you may actually see a overgrowth or ingrowth of granulation tissue or tumor. The expand cell mechanics of the stent is extremely important because it dictates how the stent's interaction with the airway. The post-implantation management is also very important clinically, meaning once the patient have a stent, that patient should be viewed as part of your patient panel, and you should have a develop, you should develop a standardized management protocol within your own practice. Um, and that means adequate clinic follow-up, adequate bronchoscopy follow-up, when to detect problems early and intervene early. And finally, all stents should have a consideration when they place in um, and when you should take out the stent. So at the time of placement, you should have to be thinking about the problem, um, should I take the stent out in some time near the future? And this is especially the case for the benign etiology of stents. For the malignant etiology of 
um, of uh, requiring stem placement. You should also think about it because the patients may respond to the systemic treatment in ways that come surprising to you. Now, one that, what is the challenges in studying um, uh, self-expanding metallic stent or SEMs? Well, the self-expanding metallic stent has evolved over the past 30 years, as you have already seen from first generation to second generation to third generation. So all the studies being published is really timely at the time of publication, but you also need to interpret the publication with respect to the time it was published. The techniques in stent placement and follow-up are not uniform. So you also need to make sure you take that into consideration when you're evaluating and when you're reading these papers. What is the best stent then? So as mentioned, we have silicone stents, we have metallic stent either covered or partially covered or uncovered. And then there's obviously under uh, investigation stents, bioabsorbable, bio drug eluding, or 3D printed stents. Um, and these are just a panel of variety of stents that are out there. And now there are more uh, that should be added to this panel. Well, what is an ideal stent? And in this slide from Dr. Galdey, um, which I uh, commandeered, um, he goes through a, a eight different type of considerations to create an ideal airway stent. Number one, it should, bio, it should be biocompatible meaning that you should be stable in the airway and does not cause any damage to the airway or irritation to the airway, chemical irritation. It should be biostable, meaning that it does not degrade inside the airway. It should fit perfectly with patient's anatomy. So meaning that it shouldn't be a tubular stent in a organic shape, but it should be potentially in the shape of patient's airway. It should cause minimal introduction to clearance of the secretions. So uh, as you know, if we place a tubular stand or a stand that is fully covered, it interrupts the mucociliary elevator in the airway. And as a result of that, you will cause decreased secretion clearance. You will hinder secretion clearance. Um, and you should resist biofilm formation because with biofilm, you get plugging, you get mucus, uh, mucus uh, formation, and also you get infection um, that could occur distal to the stent. Um, and it should be easily placed and removed. It, we should eliminate the chance for migration, and hopefully it is also inexpensive to make. But such stent, unfortunately, does not exist. It's the famed unicorn uh, in, uh, in, our, in our field. So, Let's take a moment to visit each type of these stents that we talked about. What about the silicone stent? The Dumont stent is still the most widely used. It's made of silicone, it has, has a studded outer surface, and is, um, uh, is very well tolerated. However, it does, uh, it, it does require uh, placement uh, with uh, specialized training, um, uh, specifically using rigid bronchoscopy. Um, it is easy to uh, customize. And later on, hopefully we can get to a video that I can show you from one of the WABIP uh, meetings where a group from Japan have shared their uh, silicone stent modification approaches. So these are different type of approaches in terms of modification. You can see that the variety of Franken stents that are made. But silicone stent also do fracture. So um, uh, if you see that uh, in this particular case, this is a uh, silicone stent that's been in a patient for over 10 years, 10 to 20 years. Um, and, and as a result of that, the silicone material became hardened over time and fallen into multiple pieces when it was removed. So the very first experience publication, one of the, one of the very well um, recognized publications, this one done by Dr. James von Dumont, was the first publication in the JOBIP or in this case, the JOB in 1996, where Dr. Dumont summarized his experience for over seven years uh, for over a, 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 a thousand patients, uh, over 1,500 stents uh, were evaluated. And you can see that in this cohort, in his cohort, there's about 10% chance of migration. Obstruction by secretion is about 4%. 
and there's about 8% granulation risk. So all of the things that we talked about earlier exist in this particular numbers. Um, and how do we minimize complications then with an um, silicone airway stent? Well, appropriate size and stent selection will reduce the chance of migration. Uh, and a standardization of stent maintenance protocol, in this case, this is the stent protocol that, um, that's used at Beth Israel Deaconess and, uh, and MGH when I trained, where um, uh, expectorant is, uh, is recommended, a mucolytic is suggested as well, and also using a, a nebulized saline uh, in a, a, a twice a day, three times a day, or um, four times a day uh, with oral hydration. Um, now, um, uh, it could be a normal saline or it could be hypertonic saline. A lot of times we recommend hypertonic saline now for stent hydration protocol. Um, the patient education is important because they need to be compliant with these type of treatment, especially when you're treating the patient with four times a day nebulization that requires about 15 minutes to 20 minutes per treatment. So that adds an hour into that patient's day. Um, and it's important to have a stent card that you give to the patient. So it's, on the card, it should have the location of the stent, what type of the stent, the size of the stent, any precaution the patient should take. Because if that patient getting in trouble and you are not there, then that patient can actually show the card or have that card to the other, hand the card to the other healthcare providers uh, so that they can, they, they'll know what type of precaution they need to take. Now, what is the concern for a metallic stent? Well, a metallic stent can fracture, as you can see here. And if they have been integrated into the airway, they can be very difficult to remove. And because of that, the bare metallic stent, the bare metallic stent, not, par not partially covered or covers metallic stent, um, has the warning from the FDA from 2005 that talked about using metallic tracheal stent, again, metallic tracheal stents, as a bridge to other therapy is not recommended as a first line, right? Uh, because removal of such a metallic stent can result in serious complications. Now, so if you look at the metallic stent, um, what are some of the advantages and what are some of the disadvantages? Well, the disadvantage is really hard to remove these stents, but what are the advantages? Well, yeah, the stents can be administered or applied or inserted via topical anesthesia or via moderate sedation by flexible bronchoscopy. And in a resource limited area, they may be actually very easy to do. Um, better internal to external diameter ratio. So what does that mean? Well, the, the stent's wall to the actual stent's diameter is very favorable because these stents are very, very, uh, have very thin wall, has larger airway lumen, and you can actually see it on chest X-ray because they're radio really opaque. It has lower incidence of granulation because the in through the struts, in through these beer metallics and struts, you have ingrowth of um, of material, and you could potentially anchor these stents. Uh, this ingrowth material could be granulation or tumor. Um, and for uncovered stent, there's no obstruction across uh, broncholobar orifices, so you don't actually gel any bronchial takeoffs because the actual pores uh, in the stent allows airflow. And most importantly, it also does not interrupt mucociliary clearance. So it actually allows normal, uh, normal parenchyma, normal epithelium to grow over. So maybe it actually check off, and also it conforms to the patient's uh, anatomy. So you actually check off a lot of areas that we consider as ideal stent. But the major problem here is it's difficult to remove and it's quite dangerous. But what if we can address this? So in one of the first papers in 2016, um, Dr. Simmoff's group in uh, uh, Henry Ford uh, looked at about 19 stents that were removed from 16 separate procedures in 14 patients. As you can see, majority of it are covered ultraflex and these are partially covered stents. And, um, uh, and only four of which are uncovered ultraflex, which is completely bare metallic stents. These stents were removed anywhere between 35 days to 595 days. There are no complications. Um, and uh, with, uh, uh, with 10 procedures done as outpatient, 70% were discharged immediately after the procedure. 
the material that were used or majorly used was, uh, or the, the, the modality that was used rather is uh, ND YAC laser at that time. The procedural complications are listed as below. As you can see that partial thickness tear uh, occurring one patient, fracture stent during the removal it happened at one time, Respiratory, uh, respiratory failure occurring two patients, vocal cord spasm, et cetera. But majority of the patient did okay without any complications. So then um, uh, following this, uh, Dr. Majid and Dr. Folk, uh, group at uh, Beth uh, uh, where, where I train, um, uh, uh, published this paper looking at using cryoprobe to remove granulation tissue and then subsequently follow this with dilation of the area uh, between the stent and the wall with the Jackson dilator and demonstrated that it's actually safe uh, to uh, remove a self-expanding metallic airway stent this way. And then again, I, I note that this is a partially covered airway stent, again, a, par a partially covered air, uh, ultraflex. Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Swan. Um, uh, has published this paper when he was at the uh, Cleveland Clinic um, uh, with Dr. Matruzak and Dr. Gauday. This is a fully ingrained, epithelialized, metallic, um, uncovered metallic stent uh, that the, uh, the team used an oversized silicone stent to place in the airway, causing necrosis, uh, causing local ischemia, and then uh, uh, being able to then subsequently remove the silicone stent and remove the metallic stent afterwards. So um, this is another modality of, an, uh, of, um, uh, of removal. Now, what about uh, other ways that we can, uh, uh, we can potentially remove fully ingrained, fully implanted um, um, beer metallic stents? In this study by Dr. Henry Cote, um, he actually did this study while he was at an, uh, UCSD, I believe. Um, he looked at a ex vivo study, a ex vivo uh, um, uh, situations where silicone stent, cover wall stent, cover ultraflex, uncover wall stent, uncover ultraflex were subject to um, a different FiO2s or a different uh, a fraction of inspired oxygen. Uh, and then applied variety of doses um, of argon plasma coagulation, either at 40 watts or 80 watts, um, and using an argon glass gas flow of 0 0.8 liters per minute through a flexible um, a bronchoscope. This, these are done as an animal study, not in humans. As you can see, that the stent damage occurred in a variety of, uh, of areas. So at 100% FiO2, silicone actually caught on fire at three seconds. Same thing with cover wall stents, same thing with uh, covered ultraflex stents, but it did not happen with uncovered ultraflex or wall stents. Um, and also, um, um, and also uh, if you were to lower the FiO2, uh, none of the airway fire occurred. Um, and the stents tolerated uh, in terms of treatment with these type of uh, with these type of um, uh, 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 seconds of treatment, so to speak. So taking that into a consideration, taking that data into consideration, what if we can actually remove a bare metallic stent with APC? This is a patient uh, status post transplant uh, who developed a malaysic area who came to see us um, uh, with um, uh, a uh, already fully ingrained um, uh, airway stent that is bare, uh, as you can see, this is before treatment. This is what it looked like. And the granulation tissue is actually due to a fractured um, area after five years of placement. So this is a stent of being there for about five years. And you can see that strut that was there that was, um, um, uh, that was fractured. So the way that we did it was we actually used the uh, APC to treat the area call and causing devascularization uh, of the uh, mucosa. And then we used um, forceps that you saw here to mechanically debride off the mucosa. And I have to say that you can see that now when you have revealed the uh, airway struts, you actually will see a firing of APC grounding to the actual metallic stem themselves. Through a stage procedure, this stem was actually removed in block without any fracturing. And you can see that this is what the airway looked like after stem removal.
So this is the stent that was removed, um, what it looks like afterwards. So it took about three different procedures to do um, to actually achieve this effect. Um, so a uh, uh, total procedural time for this patient was around three hours over three separate procedures. So um, now what about the third generation stent, cover metallic stent? Well, these are the varieties of cover metallic stent. Um, let's talk about bonus stent. The bonus stent is um, um, uh, for the United States market have been uh, around for the past um, uh, five to uh, uh, six years. Um, and you can see that uh, it's one of the stents uh, where the 10 millimeter bonus stent can be delivered through a working channel of a therapeutic bronchoscope. Um, and you can actually visually guide the location of the stent and deliver and place it. Uh, and you can see in this image, the stent itself sits very well and wedged against the secondary carina. But what about the issues with these bonus stents? Well, the issue has been reported by, again, um, both uh, uh, Dr. Gildes group from Cleveland Clinic and Dr. Uh, Chawala's group uh, from uh, Sloan Kettering, um, where you see that granulation tissue can actually grow through the covering and the stem themselves can actually have fractures over time as well. So, um, so there are some downsides to uh, being able to compress these stents to such a small amount and having issues with covering of the stent. Now, uh, what about an um, existing pre-custom stent? Uh, now, no, this is not available in the United States. This is uh, uh, mostly available in China. Um, in a retrospect retrospective study, about 148 patients with bronchopleural fistula, uh, these stents were made to order. The sizes were typically about 10 to uh, 15 to 20% greater in diameter than the corresponding airway. And most of the procedure were done under contra sedation or local anesthesia under fluoroscopic guidance being performed by either IP or IR. And patients tolerated these, uh, uh, these procedures very well. The existing pre-custom stent, um, uh, for instance, in, uh, in this case, uh, by Microtech J stents so available in Europe or the Y stents as available in the United States are, are also available, uh, are so currently on the market for, um, uh, for usage. So this is a case that we performed here at UCSD, where we uh, um, uh, used the Y stent, the fully metallic Y stent for our patient. And the patient is a 64 year old male who presented um, to an outside hospital with worsening chronic dyspnea. He had greater than 15 uh, years of history of smoking multiple pack of cigarettes daily, has a family history of uh, lung cancer in his mom and dad. And uh, this is a CT scan of note. And you can see that there's a large subcranial mass that is growing through uh, and into the airway, causing compression. This is the actual uh, image of the initial bronchoscopy uh, the di uh, to, uh, for diagnosis. And uh, it is a, a large squamous cell that you're gonna see situated at the carina, compressing both the right and the left main stem. Um, and um, uh, causing a, a airway obstruction. The crining in this case is splayed open and obviously is not of, uh, of the normal angle uh, that we are at, uh, normal anat anatomical angle. This is during a rigid um, bronchoscopy where we, after we placed uh, a metallic stent, as you can see that this stent sits, is quite long, but uh, it sits very well right, by, or right onto uh, the upper lobe takeoff on the right side. Uh, with a right upper lobe patent, and then we're able to engage into the area. Um, and you'll see that the distal to this, there's still a uh, tumor uh, and disease. Um, and there's also the left limb uh, that goes uh, um, a little bit farther down to the left side that sits very well into the uh, left main stem, but that does not obstruct uh, the left upper lobe nor the left lower lobe. Here is the a representative CT scan post. Um, uh, and you can see that the stent sits very well, despite the fact that the tracheal limb is actually quite long. And same thing with, uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, the left main stem. So these stents, unfortunately, does not offer us the opportunity for modification. Um, so what about aero stents? Um, these stents are laser cut with anti-migration studs that are on the outside, as you can see in this close-up. It has a variety of size ranges, including the mini through the scope stents that can be used in the, um, in the uh, low bar airways. 
as you can see here, this is a, a airways a arrow stand airway sizer, where you can use the sizer airway sizer to size up the different sizes of airway stand in terms of lumen, um, and uh, and to uh, provide uh, the appropriate size, uh, the diameter of the stand. You can also use it to measure the length of the stent that's required as well. This is the portfolio of the different sizes within the Aero Mini portfolio and also the Aero stent itself. The Aero Mini most often used stents is probably six by 10 and eight by 15 and also the, the 10 and the 12 varieties. Um, and um, the Aero uh, size here is uh, you, you will use it as you need, uh, pre, be, as you determine by your measurements being a patient specific manner. So here's a video of an airway, uh, um, an aero stent being deployed. Uh, you can you you can place a guide wire into the airway of interest first, so you can guide the airway stent, uh, the aero stent into the uh, the airway of interest. Once it's placed, uh, you can use either fluoroscopy or visualization, direct visualization, to see the location where the stent is being deployed. And here's a fluoroscopic image with a paper clip that you saw to mark the proximal endpoint of the stent. And you can see that the green band is also located um, to show where the proximal end of the stent may be. And here's what it actually looks like after the placements of the stent like this, an example of which. And this is a through the scope arrow mini stent um, placement where the green proximity, the proximal marker shows the proximal deployed position of the stent itself. And you basically move the actual green marker to the location where you want the stent to end. And you can see that the stent kind of flares open once deployed, almost like a flower. Here's an arrow stent, example of an arrow stent being removed from the airway. And you can see that there is actually strings that are engineered into the proximal portion of the stent where you can lift up with a, um, uh, with a forcep. Uh, and with that, a gentle pull from the airway will release the stent and, uh, and uh, allow you for removal. You can also remove the stent um, using, um, using a, a, a rigid uh, bronchoscope as well. So here's a case example of an arrow stent, stent of an arrow um, uh, stenting. A 68 year old gentleman with no endocarcinoma uh, endocarcinoma of the rectum uh, failed to complete a recommended treatment in the past, presented with uh, gradual worsening of shortness of breath. Uh, he underwent rigid bronchoscopy with, uh, and as you can see here, is a CT scan uh, that showed the right lower lobe you know, bronchial tumor. Um, and that there's actually associated pluriffusion. He underwent uh, rigid bronchoscopy uh, and it was determined that the right upper lobe was beyond salvage and the YAG laser was used to treat the mucosal infiltration of the tumor, followed by the arrow stent placement into the right lower lobe and the BI. And this is the result uh, afterwards. And you can see that there's actual aeration of the right lower lobe afterwards for the stent placement. So biopsy performed at the time showed the metastatic rectal adenocarcinoma. The patient did well seven months on uh, chemotherapy, then developed worsening respiratory syndrome, uh, symptoms with the right lower lobe collapse on imaging. This is the pre-op imaging that you can see that the right lower lobe was completely collapsed. Um, and um, what happened was the second rigid bronchoscopy was done revealing the worsening of right, uh, you know, in the bronchial tumor burden distal to the existing right lower lobe stent. The tumor was debulked, ablated, and um, uh, so, uh, with a uh, ridge of forceps and APC. Um, and then a balloon dilation was performed and followed by placement of two six by 10 uh, aero mini stent uh, through the scope uh, technique into the basilar uh, subsegment of the right lower lobe. And this is the area that you see post implantation with the repeat aeration of the airway. And here's the endoscopic view. So that's great. Um, now, what about um, what about the uh, 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 so should, should we be now thinking about stenting every patient that comes to uh, 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 to our door? Uh, well, in, in this study uh, by uh, by Dr. Osen off from uh, um, MD Anderson, where they looked at uh, some of the complications that we talked about with airway stent placement, comparing. 
uh, metallic stent with silicone stent. Um, and in this case, you can see that metallic stent seems to be associated with more um, lower respiratory tract infections. Uh, whereas within uh, with silicone stent, it seems like the silicone, silicone stent to have a more tendency of migration. Uh, this was done in about 172 patients with 90, uh, 195 stent procedures over the span of five years. Um, and it was noted that silicone stent and uh, lower respiratory tract infection are, um, are um, uh, statistically signif significantly associated with granulation formation. Um, and finally, lower respiratory tract infection is actually associated with uh, higher risk, higher risk of, um, uh, um, of uh, mortality. Now, so what about um, the, the next question? Well, um, the, uh, should we put in a stent for every malignant airway disease the first time we see the patient um, uh, who are undergoing the procedure? Well, in this case, um, uh, again, from Andy Anderson's group, 72 patients had therapeutic bronchoscopy for malignant airway disease. 24 of these patients have one or more stent placed. Uh, and as, as you can tell, there's about 32% develop lower respiratory tract infections. And the conclusion in this case is that the uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy um, for with stent placement is associated with higher risk of infection. And, uh, uh, and then just therapeutic bronchoscopy alone because most likely because the stem is that's in place that's disrupting mucus clearance or having granulation formation. Um, and so the author in this particular paper that was published over a decade ago recommended that if ablation technique re reopened the airway and there's a good chance for the tumor to respond to the systemic treatment, chemotherapy or radiation, a strategy of initially holding off on stenting may be warranted. So maybe it's best for us to just ablate first, give the systemic treatment a chance to work, but still follow that patient and think about stenting that patient when, the prog when there's progression of disease. So just a, just a word of comment, uh, caution for everyone to consider. And the major thing that I wanna point out is here. You can see that um, when you have uh, uh, this solid line is no stent, uh, in chemotherapy post bronchoscopy, this has the best um, best outcome, and this kind of a weakly dotted line is just stent without any systemic therapy. Okay, so just stent without treatment, and you can see that these patients um, did the worst. Okay, so that being said, um, let's talk about some future directions. As I mentioned. Um, this whole journey for me and my fascination with airway stent started during my fellowship. Um, and um, before I joined the Interventional Poem Fellowship at BI, uh, BI Deaconess and MGH, um, uh, we uh, had a year of research year. And so this was my research year in my pulmonary critical care fellowship where, where I tinkered with the idea of 3D printing uh, and thought about how do I manufacture a more organic airway stent? So we actually 3D printed different modes and injection molded uh, the variety of different airway stents that you see here. And this is one of the very first models that we printed and generated a crino Y with the right upper lobe takeoff. And so we were able to actually do uh, go from a traditional um, Y stent to a, a printed plastic <laughs> airway model to a injection mode silicone uh, stent. And using, um, uh, the, using the technology that's available to me, um, uh, this uh, slicer dicer tool that's freely available online, you can actually do airway segmentation of the entire airway tree. You can segment out the area of the interest. You can then uh, feed it into a variety of CAD models and start designing different airway uh, shapes or stent shapes based on those models. Um, and these are the, uh, in a one afternoon, uh, this is one of the different models that we're able to generate. And now in the age of artificial intelligence, I've imagined this would be like little five minutes of work <laughs> instead of an entire afternoon. So we obviously got more fancy as we did more and more in terms of injection molding, trying to engineer uh, a stent that is more, um, that looks and feel more like 
a, a, a silicon stent. And in this case, this is one of the first um, uh, manufactured uh, injection motor stent based on a t uh, patient anatomy that has two different ports opening that's engineered uh, for the patient. And um, this was presented at ATS um, and where I met Dr. Gaudet, we spoke and Dr. Gaudet was able to take this um, uh, um, this approach and really drive this whole approach to uh, uh, realize this approach to our current clinical uh, theater. Uh, and he was able to use uh, the airway that model for the patient to design a stent based on the airway model and injection mode. And, and this is one of the very first implanted injection moded 3D stents that's personalized to the patient, implanted into the patient. Where, um, where I was at Duke, I was exploring how we can generate um, a, uh, a airway stent that is directly 3D printed, not molded with silicone. And this is one of the material that we're experimenting that we were experimenting with, where we 3D printed a variety of different airway stents. All of these stents are 3D printed under 20 minutes. And this is one of the stents that was uh, generated for a patient um, uh, who have an, a, a crino structure. Um, and, uh, and the company uh, that currently makes this is called the Restore 3D. Unfortunately, while we are uh, um, making headway into this uh, area, uh, we got hit by the pandemic. And as a result of that, uh, Restore 3D have to actually uh, shift um, and uh, uh, change direction to a larger market so that uh, the company can survive. Uh, suffice to say that um, uh, now Restore 3D is one of the uh, largest um, personalized prosthetic, um, uh, implantable prosthetics in orthopedic arena. Um, so they make custom shoulders, custom ankle, uh, custom, custom ankle and custom knee um, uh, that's metallic in nature, uh, de novo based on patient anatomy. So um, what are some of the take home messages? Well, the take home message is ideal stand doesn't, does not exist. Um, some of the stand do come close. Uh, no stent is benign, and I think you heard from earlier in the talk, um, maybe the very first time you do uh, the bronchoscopy in a patient without uh, treatment, uh, try to avoid putting a stent in there and uh, get the patient to treatment first, uh, but still follow and rescue when their progression of disease. Um, and then the third generation metallic stent are, are very promising, and the stent technology is constantly evolving uh, with uh, a more and more personalized stent. Uh, that is uh, uh, that is going to be um, uh, uh, coming down the pipeline, and the currently available in the uh, United States is Vision Air, and this is the uh, Dr. Gaudet's um, uh, in Cleveland Clinic Foundation's company that looks at um, uh, that looks at um, how to generate a silicone personalized silicone stent using a uh, injection mode um, model that I presented earlier. So um, I don't know if I have time, but let's see how long this video is. This is a this is a Japanese video um, that looks at how to customize silicone stent. It's about five minutes long. Denai, do I have time? Yes, yes, we have time. Okay. So I'll I'll be quiet and I'll let everyone um, I will let I'll let everyone enjoy this. Yeah, so uh, the, the, you can start uh, typing the questions to the Q&A box, and then uh, after the end of the videos, I will uh, ask Dr. Sheng to uh, chime in.
I think the, the video is coming to the end. Yeah. So, uh, there's a good amount of questions that posted in Q&A. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, in, in, a, in the succinct of time. So I group a few together. So uh, the a few questions about uh, um, using stent in the uh, tracheobronchial Malaysia or excessive dynamic collapse. So um, what's the criteria? And it's I think it's going to be a long answer. So I <laughs> <laughs> it's a short question but it's a very long answer <laughs> okay um so um uh, obviously uh, uh it's interesting we focus on most of our talk in uh malignant disease and the question is really about the benign disease i think the you you're gonna need to have a separate talk on airway sense for the benign, for benign yeah airways. that's like a whole hour of talk <laughs> <laughs> i agree i think this is an area of uh, uh really um uh, uh, hotly debated, debated uh, question. What are the criteria? When should we stand? Um, and if we do stand, how long do we stand? Um, and in what what uh, what population should we even consider as a standing uh, as a, as the primary um, uh, modality of treatment? So, um, there are actually in the past couple of years. There's been an um, an hour long um, uh, hour long uh, sessions in some of these uh, uh, in some of the national meetings, like for instance, like ABIP uh, ABIP's meeting, chest uh, that's focused on specific on this topic. So uh, if you're in those meetings, please look the look at look up that area uh, for look at those topics. So this is going to reflect my personal bias. Um, so standing for uh, trichobronchomalacia is really a way for us to test whether stabilization of the dynamic collapse nature of the airway will relieve symptoms for the patient. Predominantly, it should be used to really assess what is how much of the um, of EDAC or TBM is actually contributing to the patient's symptom uh, symptomology. 
Um, so it should be short term. It should be about it should be about two week trial, and the least amount of interruption of mucociliary clearance um, and the least amount of uh, sensation the patient may have um, with a stent is the best stent to use. And in those cases, you know, traditionally the very first papers were published with Y stent using silicone. Um, and then later on, um, Dr. Majee's group had published uh, using uh, bare metallic stent. But again, those are very short term. Um, and I don't think that is um, is it should be used as a part of a criteria, a part of a evaluation process, because ultimately these patients gets funneled, the surgical ones gets funneled uh, to uh, uh, get trichobronchoplasty. Um, now, with um, a stem placement in patients who are not surgical candidate, who's refractory to pneumatic stenting, meaning um, CPAP, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation uh, type of treatment, in those subgroup cohort, you may consider to engage in a very, and you have done stent trial and patient feel so much better and they're demanding to have a stent in, in that population. I will have a conversation with the patient and discuss what type of stent should be placed. Yeah, I think that uh, at the uh, VCDM practice, we have the same protocol as uh, uh, BI uh, DMC to do the stent trial. And uh, once the patient do better in two weeks, short term, we check the PFT, stimic walk test, and all the objective parameters. And then uh, once those the patient feel better and objectively better, so we'll send the patient for surgery. And again, um, non-surgical, we sometimes put the Y stent, silicone Y stent. But the thing is, uh, not many patients will be able to live with that for a long term. They will come up with secretions and, and tractable cough. I would say about 10, 15% of the patient will be able to get to live with the stent, but majority of them will not. Yeah. So that's to answer the questions. All right. So uh, we're down to the second questions. And uh, I select the one that related to uh, metal stent. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, let's see. What are the pros and cons using a fully covered metallic stent in a benign disease, right? And uh, there's some experts opposed not to use the um, those kind of stent in benign disease. And mm -hmm. uh, um, so they believe that like silicone stent is better. So what's your take on this one? Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> it's funny. Again, we're going to benign disease. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So I think I think benign disease in a lot of patients' mind, a lot of people's mind is um, it, it, they're often the most challenging also to treat, right? So um, uh, because these patients they don't have they often don't have a terminal illness um, that we associate with lung cancer, for instance, or metastatic disease. Um, so uh, so we're more judicious when we compare it to that. So one need to consider mechanical properties, uh, local expertise in terms of placement for these uh, um, silicone versus metallic stents. In general, metallic stents are actually easier to place in general for the newer generation ones because you can actually place them through the scope uh, largely. Um, or you can use a guy wire and you can place them via you know fluoroscopic placement. Um, but uh, the the issue uh, about these uh, a metallic stent is that the covering on the metallic stent often is polyurethane based, not silicone based, um, and these covering may have a very different um, interaction with mucus um, that's in the patient's airway. That's different than how the silicone will react. And also, these coverings because the sh because the benefit of fully covered stent is such that uh, the wall of the stent is thin as compared to, say, silicone stent, um, the covering on the wall is also very thin. So um, granulation tissue can actually grow through some of these coverings, as I've shown earlier. Um, so there are, um, so can you, uh, so getting back to the, uh, to the question, um, can you use but can you use the metallic stent in treatment of a benign airway disease? I will argue yes, you can. In some instances, you have to, especially in low bar disease when you don't have a adequate silicone stent. The silicone stent itself, if it's one millimeter wall thickness, and the low bar airway you want to place the stent in is six millimeters. Guess what you don't have much room to really breathe because you're gonna have two millimeter on either side that's gonna be wall. Um, 
So, um, and also, um, and also in this case, you know, for instance, aeromini may be a very good option for the low bar stenting for benign disease, especially related to, say, um, um, uh, TB related uh, uh, airway stenosis, benign airway disease. For inflammatory benign airway disease, I would really pause. I would actually take a very, very careful look at all the other factors can cause worsening inflammation prior to putting a stent. Because placing a stent in a patient who has a potential for flare or who has an inflammatory etiology as their stent, as, as their airway stenosis, that stent itself will worsen local inflammation and will likely cause you to use longer, more, or stent over stent. You may become, to, you may get yourself into a bind. So I would think about very carefully about the inflammatory etiology of airway stenosis when you should put in the stent. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's definitely. Um, so we, I would go for two more questions. I will go with the, the short one first. So mm -hmm. in post-transplant uh, airway dehiscence, uh, which stent is better, uh, silicone or carbon metallic? It may not be either. So I will let you <laughs> <go on that. laughs> deny. I, I mean, I've been talking a lot. You are obviously training a very, very busy transplant center. What's your take on this? Well, so um, right now I'm not in the transplant center anymore, but uh, because I have some experience at the uh, Cleveland Clinic, and obviously I have to refer the paper to Dr. Tomeda. So you go to his talk. He will always put in talking about the one of the stand that he did. So the answer is uh, to use a cover metallic stand. So with the caveat that the, the met cover, oh no, non-cover, a bare metal. So you want a bare metal, the effect to create a granulation tissue to heal the dehiscent part. And then uh, once that happens, you can remove the stand. Usually take uh, several weeks for that to happen. So uh, that would be the one of the only indication that I can think of to use the bare metal stand in the benign disease. Yeah. So, um, and I, I agree with that. I think also um, uh, remembering in this case is also about the size of dehiscence, I feel like, right? So if you have a pinhole defect, sometimes no stent is a bad stent, which yes, is meaning definitely. nutrition, 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 eliminate all possibilities for infection in the area and additional ischemia and, um, and just antibiosis and nutrition. And over time, patient may surprise you yeah actually the, the a lot of these small uh small defects actually heal by by cell without any stent but for larger defect like complete dehiscence that you don't want to go into the r whether you want some something to be done well uh, you could put a bare metallic stent in those situations and kind of cause the two literally get the two and two together um, um, and, and granulate in so that, so that you can actually have a, uh, you can actually have a, uh, a, a, a airway. So there, I believe, um, I believe, um, uh, if I, if I recall correctly, there was a couple of, um, a couple of instances like this, uh, pretty dramatic cases, one of which was, uh, from, uh, University of Michigan, uh, from, uh, uh, a Jose de Cardenas group. They were, they were, um, uh, they reported on the usage of bare metallic stent in patient with a complete dehiscence. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I didn't see that paper, but the idea is very uh, intrigued. Yeah. All right, one last question. So it's about the, um, they come down to like personal light, the stand, the stand like a 3D. But besides that, do you have any suggestion like how to optimize the size and the shape of the stand? Mm -hmm. Tricky question, yeah. So what, in so, your, what do you practice to, size, to sizing properly at the stand? Mm, great question. So um, before I will use um, I, I will use the uh, both the CT scan and just use a traditional uh, axial view, coronal view, and sagittal view to kind of do my best measurement. And then more recently, I discovered that uh, they actually have an NPR projection, NPR projection, multiplane reconstruction, multiplanar reconstruction. So. Um, so in certain radio, radiology programs, you can actually use your traditional uh, axial um, uh, projection or, or the stack. Uh, you can tell the program to reformat it into a way that you can actually rotate the axis 
So if the axial axis is in a vertical line, well, most of our most of our body, if you look at my body, my body, I'm I'm curved, right? I'm not a straight line person. So so bad posture. <laughs> um but 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 really you could actually shift the angle at which you're looking. So if you're actually shifting the reconstruction to match the airway, uh, uh, the airway path, you can have a very, very straight cut of the airway. Then they can actually accurately measure the um, uh, the distance in terms of the diameter of the airway, both in, corona, both in the coronal view and also in the axial view. I do the same thing for the um, for the left main stem and the right main stem. But you, but it does require a careful review of the CT scan and also some um, uh, knowledge about the multi, uh, the multiplanar reconstruction. Yeah, so I have to learn the technique. So next time I'm gonna pick your brain on that. I have to see like how does it work. So, uh, yeah, in my practice when I was in Utah, I used the stencizer. I think at that time, it just came out the one that that uh, Morit provide. Yeah. It it's pretty uh, easy to use and uh, it. it get pretty accurate sizing. And then when I moved to other location that's not available anymore. So why should you, I use the uh, balloon, the CRE balloon. That's uh, yep. that's what I train at Henry Ford. So, and just feel it like how tight it is in the airway and then uh, try to get the, the diamond that closest, the closest to that. So that's how I sizing the, the, the stent. Yeah, so the reason I, I totally agree. I mean, that the intraoperatively, you should, the, the difference I'm talking about here is pre-op planning. Mm -hmm. And you drop. So absolutely agree with you. So if you don't have the airway sizer, airway sizer is great. If you don't have the airway sizer, uh, use this, uh, any type of balloon you have in your facility because you're likely going to need to dilate the area anyways, and you use the mm -hmm. balloon to assess. Um, and um, uh, and obviously, um, um, you know, if you can, if you have a good sense of right before the procedure start, you can potentially pre in a pre op setting to modify the stents. So that you know, like silicone stents to match what you need, like very much like with the video that we just saw show. Yeah, so I got a comment that the video from uh, Dr. Miyasawa in Toyama, Japan. So it's very nice working video. Yeah, very so very nice. That's... Yes, yes. So all right, so uh, I think we have to um, be out of time, so we have to conclude the session. So again, I'd like to thank you, Murit, for sponsoring this uh, webinar, and then uh, great talk from Dr. George Sheng and the. Uh, Seeing that we learned a lot today. All right. Thank you very much. And then we'll uh, stop the recording. Enjoy your evening. Bye-bye, everyone.